Then, but I said, can I? He said, no, it's fine. So when I say Lord, it's not a sign of disrespect. The man gave me permission to call him by, by his name. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I could say Bradon, but I couldn't say Bralot. I don't know why. So Bradon, at the, at the funeral of, uh, of, uh, of Gajeni, he utters like some, some important words. And he says, I quote, he talks about the table and times at some point in South Africa and the BMF and says that these turbulent times in South Africa punctuated by a turmoil are, are that, uh, that rise in anger and resistance of our people. What they ignored to tell us about Gajeni was that between 1987 and 1991, he was the brain thrust of the BMF. It was during this time when he began, uh, the, we began to engage the liberation movement in exile it was during this time when Lord led the onslaught against the, the participation of, uh, uh, into negotiation, which he labeled a sham, uh, that it cannot be legitimized. The BMF refused to be co-opted for obvious reasons. The BMF demands were clear. Its demands were clear. Release Mandela and all those incarcerated for their noble efforts of freeing South Africa, unban liberation movements, and allow exiles back into their motherland. So it was during this period that the high command of the BMF was also pressured to change its name. It was during this period that the thorny issues that were there, I mean, I know this, I think it was around the time I joined the BMF. There were BMF leaders that say the BMF must change its name to be more palatable to, to new South Africa. And it was Lord who engineered, spearheaded, and conjured the strategy to install Prof. Nkutlu as our successor in 1991. This is Pradon, by the way. The rationale being that he was the best person to lead the BMF, and, uh, and he will take it back to its fundamental roots, back to basics of developing managerial leadership in the country. And when there's a return of our leaders from exiles and Robben Island, so we needed a perfect gentleman among gentlemen to lead the BMF. Ours was too confrontational, underpinned by strong political undertones and overtones, we have been labeled as agitators. It says, Lord was a strategist par excellence, close quote. And I, I, Lord has told me this story about how Prof. Nkutlu came into the BMF, by the way. So, so, so there was this conference of the BMF taking place in Sun City. Uh, Braton Connors was stepping down. And then they thought that Ruel Koza will, be, will, be, will, will make himself available to lead. And he told them that he's not going to make himself available to lead. They thought he's bluffing or he's joking. And then when the reality dawned that uh, he's not making himself available, and then it was almost free for all, and everyone wanted to be, to be the president. Lord allowed the conference to transact on all other items except the election of the president. He told everyone in the gathering to say none of them were ready and prepared to lead the BMF. He stopped it alone, one man stop the conference from transacting. And then there was a crisis committee of four people comprised of Lot himself, Royal Cause, Ampumelelo, uh, George Chume, and, 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 and George Negot. So they had to, to resolve the crisis in terms of finding the leader. And uh, these are the, are, the, are the four people basically that identified Prof. Nkutlu. And Prof. Nkutlu was, uh, was, uh, was a principal of the University of Transkei and running his businesses and sitting on boards at that moment. And he had to be recruited, uh, recruited and joined the Transkei branch of the, of the, of the Mtata branch of the, of the BMF. So, and Lord has to this to say about you, Prof, uh, I quote. So Prof. Nkutlu's leadership and qualities continue to inspire many of us. His leadership and his developmental and consensus building most importantly, is a leader that he keeps his word and is a visionary, close quote. We are grateful that Prof. Nkutli is still associated with us. He doesn't graduate from the BMF. 
and he continues to lead us and he continues to chair the, the, the trust with us. I mean, Prof, I think, marvels at my, my arguments and debate with Monde in trust meetings sometimes. And then he would laugh and smile and not take side. And like things like words like this will never like, what is the payoff word that we should put on the banner? And I know it's going to be debate with me and Monde. And most of the time I win because I just lean on him. So these are my words, courage and compassion. <laughs> it has to be there. But, but in fact, these are words of Lord. But we had to choose which one basically resonates with most of us. And, and Prof. And Lov, uh, Prof. And Kutlu and, and, and Lord and Lov basically, they, they gave BMF the best partnership that we have ever experienced as the organization. It, their, their partnership is, is unsurpassed with the milestones. They, 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 they developed the affirmative action blueprint that basically ultimately culminated into Employment Equity Act that we, we have today in the country, the Skills Development Act that we have to, today, uh, and the BEE Commission, those uh, BMF has been a midwife to all these, these policies. And I would like to say the TRC submission. For me, it was, it was it's my favorite chapter in, in, in the book. Um, and, and I will quote this. Uh, Monday, I think he has a different chapter. You'll quote your favorite whenever we choose you to give the lecture. If, <laughs> if we do. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it was one of the fascinating things. I remember running to, catching him late when the... TRC was having its sessions in, uh, in, um, in downtown um, uh, uh, around that time and then to, to, to catch what Lord has to say. I mean, one of the things, like, when you're in the moment, he says these things and you're still young and some words start resonating much later with you. But my favorite quote in, uh, in his submission is when he said, the human rights violation by business are seen as those policies, practices, and conventions which denied black people the full utilization of their potential, resulting in deprivation, poverty, and poor quality of life, and which attacked and threatened to injure their self-respect, dignity, and well-being. Some of these violations were open abuses, while some were indirect, yet others buttressed those carried out in socio-political level. A close quote. So he didn't mince his words. He was clear about what needs to be, what has happened, and people needed to take accountability. We can a lot, learn a lot from Lord and his dedication and profound contribution and remarkable selflessness in the pursuit of our nation's socioeconomic transformation. <coughs> they are truly unparalleled. He edged in his name into the annals of history as a figurehead synonymous with the Black Management Forum itself. In other circles, he would be addressed as Mr. BMF himself. Throughout his journey, he didn't merely engage with the challenges and opportunities of his time. He embodied the relentless spirit of progress. His actions resonated beyond the confines of personal ambition, embodying the profound commitment to advancing the welfare and prosperity of our country. In the grand narrative of our country's transformation, his influence shown as a guiding light, illuminating path uh, towards more inclusive and equitable society. His tireless efforts and unwavering advocacy left in, in a, 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 a and indelible mark, uh, leaving us with a legacy that inspires uh, generations to come. In his journey, he personified what it means to be a catalyst for positive transformation, illustrating that individuals with a clear vision and a resolute spirit can effect monumental change. His legacy serves as a testament to the uh, potential of each and one, every one of us in terms of how we hold and make a lasting impact to the world around us. So Lord was sometimes a priest or a warrior. It was just not easy 
uh, to, to know which Lord to expect. So when Lord stepped in to address the gatherings of the BMF, particularly uh, at conferences, there was always uh, this air of anticipation. We would be, whether we would be greeted by Lord the eloquent priest or Lord the resolute warrior. So that was the question. He was multifaceted. Uh, he kept us on the edge of our seats. He was eager to glean wisdom from whichever facets he chose to share with us that day. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is, these are the lenses that I wish to us to delve into this character, Lord Nlovu, uh, which was a complex character and exploring various dimensions on, on how they intersect. So, so one of the things, I mean, on the warrior side of things, I mean, early days when I was the BMF MD, uh, Mzwane Lemanyi was the president. I must be careful not to use the other name. So Mzwane Lemanyi was the president. So we criticize Petrus Motsipa and his leadership of Black Business Council, like we normally do things at the BMF. Uh, but these days, it's not happening that often. I'm not saying that you should do anything, uh, Madam President. <laughs> so we criticized uh, Patrice and BBC, and he didn't take it kindly. And then he called and wanted a meeting. And now, when we hear other people telling us that how angry Patrice was, so we needed to find out, okay, if he comes, who else is coming with Patrice? They had an entourage of people. So, so we had a tactic that we used. I had to phone the PA of Patrice to say, yeah, for catering purposes, we need to know who else is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and and so once we heard the names, we knew that we're not going to survive the day or the night or the evening. So we had to recruit Lord <laughs> to come to be part of this meeting. So this meeting, how it went, it was very simple. So we wrote a statement with Mzwanele to say, this is what we said. Media quoted us out of context. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mzwanele would say, okay, now that I'm conflicted part, I'm gonna hand over the meeting to Lord. <laughs> so we all basically ran away and hide behind Lord, and Lord fought for us. So, it, it has to be understood within, within that, 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 that context that is a man that he would literally fight when, when there was a need to do that. Actually, it was at the memorial service of Bradon here in Joburg, as we were about to bury Bradon, that Dr. Ruel Koza shared a compelling narrative. He drew a striking parallel likening Don Mkonazi and Lord Ndlovu to none other, the revered disciples, that word again, disciples of Jesus, John and Peter, who were captivated by the profound resonance of their impact and influence. Yet tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I would prefer to, to envision Lord as the Paul of the Black Management Forum. Similar to Paul, who embraced Christianity much later, uh, he was not there with the original disciples and actually he never met the, the, the Jesus Christ himself. Uh, Paul joined late, but mid Lord is mistaken as people who are founders of the BMF, although he joined late. Paul never met Jesus Christ. And uh, it is not worthy that his writings uh, of Paul he was the first person to write about Jesus. He wrote like pretty much 15 years after his, 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 his passing. And the next person who would write was 40 years later, uh, the gospel of, uh, of, um, of Mark. So Paul's interpretation of Christianity played a pivotal role in the expansion of Christianity beyond the confines of Judaism, this decimating the teachings in a, to the global aid audience. And uh, now today, Christianity can, can be proud of uh, 2.6 billion individuals worldwide who are part of it. And when it started as an offshoot of, uh, of, um, of uh, Judaism. 
And uh, today we call the BMF positions on different matters as the BMF positions. But most of these positions come from the pen of Lord and Love. In fact, there are Lord and Love's positions that we adopted. So amongst others, it's fairness, equity, and justice, which he popularized as the key pillars of the BMF. They come from his, his pen. And they also happen to be the tenets of uh, Paul's ministry, if you, you read the Bible like I do. So Lord's doctrine <laughs> was similar to that of, of, of Paul. And then one of the, 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 the quotes that basically come close, I think it was a conference in, in Cape Town, Lord the priest showed up that day and he, he uttered some words and amongst other things this, he said, when you do well financially, you must do good or right because doing well goes hand in hand in doing right. It must be done consistently for its own sake. You cannot do right externally without being right internally. Internal equity and fairness are the basis for external participation and doing good in the broader environment. Close quote. And Paul, in 1 Timothy 6, 18, he would say that to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, it's what is expected of every Christian. So Lord, though a late come at the PMF, he left an indemnable mark in the organization. He was often mistaken as a founder, as I've just said, uh, but his conviction was clear. Brilliant ideas uh, need effective organization to become tangible realities. That's what he was all about. He was not, he knew that you can have as brilliant ideas as you as you may have, without good organization to champion those ideas. Those ideas are as good as not having them. Lord was also a man of parables, analogies, and metaphors. So, so there was no speech of Lord without any of those things. So, so he would come up with the idea of a spear and a shield. And he would say that the shield embodies the values, ethics, and principles that guide one's actions and decisions. It represents a moral compass of that individual hold and reflect their integrity, honesty, and commitment in upholding what is just and right. The shield serves as a protective barrier guiding against actions that may compromise their values. On the other hand, the spear signifies the performance actions and execution. It embodies the practical applications of one's skills, talents, and knowledge towards achieving goals and objectives. The spear represents a proactive stance individuals need to take in contributing to their communities and advancing their personal and professional pursuits. It symbolizes the willingness to take initiative and make progress and effect positive change. And some, I think I remember when you talk about the parable of the sower. I mean, this is in the Bible story. Uh, those who don't go to church, uh, there's a story about, <laughs> about uh, uh, Jesus describing basically the planting of seeds in four different types of soils, the path, the rocky, the thorny, and the good soil. And then so Lord emphasis was that um, just as we find the best growth in, in the receptive soil, individuals with talent thrive in right companies and organizations. So therefore the problem is not the individual, it is the environment that basically needs to be transformed. And you would go and say that there's nothing wrong against swimming against the tide as long as you don't lose your rhythm. Uh, meaning that in his mindset, this mindset encourages us to to see the problems and growth, uh, and, and growth opportunities and find ways towards even when situations seem difficult to try to go and about and achieve them. It shows the power of achieving goals uh, in most difficult situations. And one of my favorite, you would say that the BMF is, uh, uses race-based strategies to arrive at a colorblind end. So we're sharp in terms of how we raise these issues, but 
the PMF itself, it's not a racist organization, but we, we, we almost, we, we dramatize how we, 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 we do these sort of things so that at least we could come up, at least come on a, on a, on a common point. So Lord has been fortunate in his life. I think one of the things that he was asked actually um, about his rise in corporate and, and unusual roles that he has played in executive career, in executive positions in his career. Uh, one person that uh, basically supported Lord was a gentleman called Leon Cohen. Leon was the CEO of uh, Bison. And uh, in fact, Leon is the one who paid for Lord's school fees and uh, he bought uniform and stationery for his children when he worked for the BMF for free. That's Prof. Uncle. He left his paying job at Philips to work for the BMF and save the BMF when the BMF was collapsing. So Leon Cohen paid for the school fees and the uh, books since then, you remember? <laughs> and one other person who did that for Lord was Richard Lobsham of NetBank, who gave Lord unusual breaks. When quizzed about this uh, Lord himself, about these unusual breaks, he would say, there are some white people, two or three, <laughs> who for some reason decided to assist. The key question is at what price to themselves. And they will quickly add that companies have brought black people into high ranks in order to avoid criticism or for reasons of repositioning themselves. Companies have strategically elevated black people to prominent positions, not solely out of their genuine commitment and to diversity and inclusion but often a response to external pressures and reputational enhancement. So he would balance that in as much as he would give credit to those who gave him the breaks. And Lord would sometimes credit his success on luck. He said it often. He's actually one person I know most of the times that you need luck. You may do all these sort of things, but you also need luck. So this perspective humbled him, and it reminded him that the, 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 the unpredictable nature, it reminded him of the unpredictable nature of success. However, it's also a testament of his humility uh, amidst his achievement. He acknowledged that the role of external forces in shaping his journey, and he recognized that his journey was, 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 was not solely on the result of his own efforts and choices, but also the influence of external forces beyond his control. So Lord, we go back to NetBank. Uh, he joined Netco in 1993, uh, as I've said earlier on, and assumed those different positions. And it was at the position when he was the HR director of Netco, he came up with uh, what is called today the NetBank's 10 tr uh, transformation truths. Those come from uh, the, hand, the pen of Lord, even if they didn't tell us that we will know it because we will see. All his things only come in five or 10, but most of the time it was 10 things. So these truths I thought I should share with you. So truth number one, transformation, these are 10, NetBank's 10 truths on transformation. It is the right thing to do. Transformation is a business imperative. Number two, transformation affects every single area of our business. Number three, it is the responsibility of every person to make it happen. Four, trust and transparency is required. Everybody should be heard. Five, transformation at NetBank must be unifying, fair, and transparent. Six, transformation will have a short-term cost with the long-term benefits. Seven, transformation targets will be embedded in our strategies and business plans through ongoing consultation. Eight, we will proactively grow and develop our own pool. Nine, we will focus strongly 
on the support and empowerment of black people with a particular emphasis on Africans, all women, and all people with disabilities. Truth number 10, transformation is non-negotiable. That was a classical lot in love then, ladies and gentlemen. It was clear, and they are still there. If you want to look them up, you may, you may find them. So one of the things I think, I did share this story. I, I think what I'm going to say is some of the things that other people can see as criticism. It's not a criticism, it's a critique. There's a difference between criticism and a critique. So the first time and the only time I saw Lord Nlovu exhausted and defeated, uh, it is a night that we, we had a dinner at the Westcliff. Um, I've never seen him dejected. His spirit was crushed and the lowest of all time since I've ever known him. Uh, that day, the day that happened to be the last board meeting of People's Bank. And then so NetBank decided to shut down the People's Bank. So Black People's Noble Cause and Dream essentially was no more. The dream for owning black, uh, the, the dream of black people owning and managing their own bank was killed. And Lord had been at the helm of, uh, of People's Bank for, as a CEO for, 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 uh, for some time at that particular moment. And his personal successful career in banking was exterminated. Roles were transposed, and then I had to be the mentor that night. So Kajeni believed that People's Bank should have been allowed to grow and compete until, and compete with NetBank, uh, until it was appropriate for the two entities to be merged. And the People's NetBank uh, was, was, was to grow out of these two entities. And by the way, you, you could read, if you want, the, 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 the People's Bank image brand was growing faster than any other brand within the banking sector at that moment. It started basically uh, uh, to, as, a, as a market for the low end of the market. But Lord and other people within the bank, they managed to get people within the middle class to start joining around. And the net bank saw that as a threat into their market. Then they killed it. It was an arrested development. So People's Bank basically occupied the space of what we call Capitec today. And it was there before Capitec. And here's the effects, just to contrast. Capitec started in 2001. The market cap of, people, of NetBank today is 100 billion, as opposed to 196 billion of Capitec. The share price of, of NetBank today, or yesterday when I was finalizing the speech, it was 200 rand, and the share price of uh, Capitec, it's 1,682. So this leads to, it's a clear demonstration that transformation is a business imperative. So final thing around, around NetBank, it's, it's on, the, on the story of a black CEO. So, so Lord, one of the biggest disappointments and regrets that he had is that he didn't win the battle to appoint a black CEO at NetBank. He fought very hard. He crossed swords with a number of people, including black directors on the board. And he believed that there must be a critical mass of black people in these positions. And, and that's how most of, of, um, of, 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 of people who end up being on the boards of, of NetBank itself. It was because of his effort. In fact, if you were to put this thing into context. And so, so what happened is that there was an appointment, it was reversed, and Lord started withdrawing his involvement within the bank and ultimately left in the, the bank in 2009. And to put this thing into perspective, Sim Shabalala has been a CEO of Standard Bank for more than 10 years now. 10 years. And NetBank could have had their black CEO long before then. That's why Lord packed his bed and left. So, doing things the typical way of, of things, Lord will never 
miss an opportunity to, 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 to put a challenge out there. The challenge I would give, I would like to put out there to the, to the Black Management Forum, the president is there, I think, we need to up the game in terms of our, our work of advocacy, in terms of what is happening. There's a lot of things that is happening around um, measures and acquisitions. Um, so, so if we're to look at the theme of deconcentration of, uh, if we're to deconcentrate the markets and the economy, which is basically the critical mandate of the comp uh, Competition Commission, we feel like I think they're, they're not playing as much role as they, they should be doing. Or well, they are doing their jobs, but the approved transactions, basically, are the transactions where the dominant players, basically, are gobbling up the rest of other things. There are no new black entrants that are coming through. We need to put them in a spotlight, so to speak, and hold them accountable. Because Competitions Act, amongst other things, its purpose is to promote greater spread of ownership in particular to increase the ownership stakes in his, uh, of historical disadvantaged people. Close quote. It's their mandate. And I think they are failing at it. And so in doing that, we could look at, to, to deracialize the economy, you, you need to look at the way it's concentrated. It's concentrated in big, these big uh, con conglomerates. And, 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 and South Africa's story is very unique. Uh, so let me, let me, eating in Khabli say, So there's a, there's a, there's a four or five big companies in any industry in South Africa. It's an anomaly. No other country has what we have. And so what needs to happen is to, is to deconcentrate. We have seen a glimpse of deconcentration. Remember that South Africa's uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, economy is built on the backbone of mining. So the mining companies, okay, the question was when you say deconcentrate, that when was the concentration in the first, first place? Two, two events happened. So, so mining companies, to capture the value chain, they had to venture into steel, into, into explosives, engineering, and chemicals businesses or industries in order to be able to effect the mining that they had. So that's why Anglo-American would own AECI, which has chemicals business, has nothing to do with mining, but they would do that to capture that. Other than ESCO, that was government owned, every other steel company was owned by mining companies. So that's how concentration happened. And the second event, it was, uh, it was driven by the sanctions. When the, the, the foreign investors had to divest, so the only people who can be able to pay a check or sign a check and acquire those assets were the mining companies. That's why Anglo-American ended up owning SAB, Edgars, Toyota, Media Company, Tonga, Tulet, Mondi, FNB, Zonk. So that's how it happened. So now we need to make sure that the agenda of deconcentration it's visible and it happens, but this time around, new entrants and black owners must emerge in owning these entities. Then we'll be honoring the legacy of, 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 of Lord and Love. So, two things I wanna touch on and then, and then I, will, I will sit down. So one of the things that I never thought about this until I was asked to, to do this, this, uh, this, this lecture. Uh, I'm doing this lecture because I think Prof. Nkutlu said I must do it. And, and we, don't, we don't say anything, we don't say no to Prof. Nkutlu, by the way. Uh, so when, we, when I joined the BMF, actually, we, we were so scared of you, Prof. And uh, Prof. Was, was, would allow a debate to go by, when, but when he feels irritated, you will cut the debate, or if the debate is not going his way, we will say, you're out of order. And then you, it's the end of the story. So I'm not saying you are a dictator, Prof, but it was bothering closer to, to that. So, so one, one of the things that I was, I was, I was wrestling with is uh, it's, uh, it's Lord Ndlovu from his political philosophy and, 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 and ideology. So he, he had what 
pretty much I would call thinking approach. Of his thinking approach was, was to learn, unlearn, and relearn, if we were to simplify it in a language that most of us would, would, would understand. And learning, unlearning, and relearning is a, is a cycle of, of gaining and applying knowledge, discarding the old dated information and gaining the new information and building upon, upon it and updating the previous knowledge that you had. I mean, you can see here that everybody was saying that about Lord as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a thinker. So, so that's what he introduced within the BMF and challenging mo most of us in terms of how we do this. That's why most of us will meet Lord. By the time you finish having just a dinner with Lord, you are tired. He will tire you just from a conversation. And then you'll, he will talk to you about something over the phone. I remember driving, I said something. He said, no, what kind of a reasoning is that? So I, I knew, when he says that, you know, you need to rephrase <laughs> and, and, and improve in terms of your thinking. And so that's why we're schooled. I think if I was a university professor, he would be encouraging his student to, 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 do, to use the grounded up uh, theory uh, approach and, uh, and the critical race theory. These, these are tough theories, but they are relevant to situations uh, uh, like that, that we are experiencing in, in South Africa today. One of the strange things, actually, when, as, as a lot passed on when we're busy with the, literally we're tell, tell, tell end of the discussion with the publishers for his book. And, and for some reason, I, I remember when he wanted to have Mandela and Clinton on the cover of the book. I actually don't remember his reasons why he wanted that, but I remember insisting that his picture must also be there uh, with those things. But as I was reflecting to one thing I regret that I never had this philosophical discussion. Maybe, maybe thought it's a waste of time with me because I wouldn't grasp them that time. I don't know. But, but, but then I looked at Mandela's political philosophy as well. He believed in Ubuntu, but he was an African nationalist. And, and, and his ideology focused on dismantling apartheid, tackling institutional racism, and fostering racial reconciliation. He was determined to fight against oppression and injustice, and he had the courage to, to make difficult decisions and to speak the truth. That was Monday. Don't, don't listen to what these youngsters in Twitter are saying. I'm telling you about Mandela. This is Mandela. And on the other hand, Bill Clinton philosophy is what they call a third way. And the third way basically be, they became, in the US, they called the New Democrat. Uh, but, but, but it's essentially what Tony Blair was, 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 was running the country on. He believed in a mixed uh, liberal conservative policies uh, to seek a balance between the two. Clinton administration focused on economic growth, job creation, and, and, and reducing the deficit. And he succeeded in, in that mission. So, Although Mandela and Clinton were friends, but their political outlook um, were, 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 were different. And, and Lord and Love became the bridge to harmonize the, the two different political philosophies and ideologies. Uh, so leaders must be willing to make difficult decisions and confront powerful forces uh, when necessary. Uh, effective leaders strive to unite diverse groups of people towards a common goal. So Lord demonstrated the value of finding common ground and building the bridges across ideological and social divides. So he was a public intellectual as well. So everybody, has, you saw the video in terms of how uh, they described him. So and a public is, 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 is a person who's wildly knowledgeable, an individual who's, who's written work or contribution uh, in, uh, uh, to a social and cultural discourse are, es are, are esteemed, and uh, not only in academic circles, uh, but they resonate to the broader uh, segment of the society. So he touched all of us across, and we could, we could understand him. So that's why I would uh, basically label him uh, 
a, a public, uh, a public, in, in, uh, a public intellectual. As I conclude, so I didn't have to. I, I didn't want to. I didn't. I didn't want us to have a theme for this lecture. Largely because I wanted to. Firstly, one, I respect themes, but two, I wanted to say whatever I like. So, so Monday, I said, Monday, okay, you decide, you, you can come, and I gave three ideas and I picked this one. Uh, but now it talks about the key lessons uh, uh, from remarkable life of, of, of Lord and Love. I'm gonna do it the Lord and Love style. I have five uh, key lessons that we can learn from this remarkable life of Lord and Love. Lesson number one is is the trajectory of uh, the future lies in the hands of those who possess the ability not only to envision it but also to actively influence its course and give it a meaning these individuals are architects of what is to come charting new paths formulating novel ideas and forging an innovative direction they are the ones not only participate in the future but also have the power to breathe life into their visions, thereby sculpting the worlds into uh, that eventually unfold before us. It is through the life of Lord and Love that we understand the profound impact that the visionary thinkers, innovators, creators have in shaping our destiny and the, our course of history. Lesson two, transformation is not a mechanical process but a deeply human one. Lord taught us a profound interconnection between empowerment, ownership, and transformation. He underscores the idea that true transformation is multidimensional process that requires active participation and ownership from black people. He teaches us that the importance of unlocking opportunities and ensuring that individuals have stake and a say in their own empowerment. He emphasizes that true transformation is a collective effort and ownership is a powerful catalyst uh, for driving meaningful change and sustainable progress. Lesson three, the importance of humility in recognizing the influence and external factors in one's journey to success. That's what it teaches us. It teaches us that uh, while hard work, talent, and determination are critical, there are elements beyond our control, like luck and unforeseen circumstances that play a role, uh, that play a role in our achievements. This perspective encourages us to remain grounded, acknowledging that success is a result of individual effort, but also a product of a broader forces at play. He reminds us that the great, it, it reminds us to be grateful for the opportunities and fortunate circumstances that contribute to our accomplishments. Lesson four, the significance and determination and, resi and re resilience in the face of challenges, that's what it teaches us. Lord teaches us that. Uh, Lord, Lord teaches us that uh, uh, much like navigating against the current, uh, life often uh, presents obstacles and opposition. Yet it is critical to maintain one's course and tempo. This perspective encourages us to summon inner strength, adapt strategies, and persistently forge ahead, even when circumstances seem formidable. He underscores that enduring commitment uh, to our chosen path is often the key to overcome adversities and achieving long-term success. Lesson five, the value of collaboration and, 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 and collective effort in turning great ideas into impactful realities. He recognizes that belonging to an organization provides a platform for ideas to flourish and to be championed. In his case, he entrusted his ideas to the Black Management Forum, understanding that their collective strength and shared vision would amplify their impact. This symbolic relationship between him and the BMF exemplifies a true ownership of a, a, a true ownership that true ownership is two ways, is a two-way street. 
he gave us, he gave to the organization and in return, the organization gave him a purpose and platform to enact meaningful change. This highlights the power of synergy, mutual investment in achieving shared goals and making a lasting impact on society. So finally, Lord served as a bridge to corporate South Africa's future, representing the next generation of leaders. His views and that of the BMF were neatly knitted. In fact, the BMF owned him in as much as he owned the BMF. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Lord Ntlovo for you. safe to say you can share your CV now. Because <laughs> it was supposed to be shared at the end and I would say I don't know about you but not only are we left having to think deeply but we also know more about the man we are celebrating today. I just have one question. One question. Did you buy new shoes? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just as a reminder, uh, the, the restrooms just, hey, this is when it comes into play. I always get teased with my right and my left. So, right. Through the door, right, immediate right, the signs are there. Those are the restrooms. I will tell you later where dinner will be. That's if you're nice to me. There's something you need to do in order for you to have dinner. So this one thing is standing in the way of your dinner and me. So... Let's see. How many of you have Twitter accounts? How oh, one, two, three, four. Twitter. Uh, uh, look, uh, le let's say I'm going to put it like this. Even if it's not active, <laughs> with one follower, maybe your child, maybe your wife, maybe your sp your husband. Maybe your friend, someone. Even if it's one. Even if it's no followers. How many? Okay. Okay. So, hashtag leadership inspiration. Hashtag Lot Nlovu Lecture. Tenth Lot Nlovu Lecture. Hashtag Hey, Oshel is going to be very proud of me now. PWC. <laughs> hashtag reimagining SA together. Those are the hashtags. And I want you to go to the BMF national account if you, um, if you, you want to see some of the hashtags. Let's hashtag some of the lessons that we learned from tonight's lecture. The more I see the lessons, the faster I move the program, the faster you get to eat. But when I don't see the lessons on the hashtag Aglio, and I'm a night animal because my day starts at 2 p.m. every day, so this is still my daytime. Nyaz in Lambil, but let's do it. So some of the reflections from the lecture, you think about someone who didn't mince his words, a strategist par excellence, Someone who owned the BMF and the BMF owned him. Advocating for the space to stay the same when others are advocating for change. But something struck me, Mr. Mtunzi, when you said 
You cannot do right externally without doing right internally. And there's something that, Madam President, you, you wrote in the week, and I'm going to borrow from it when you come up. When you're talking about the despondency that sets in when transformation is seemingly off the path. And tonight we hear about this, and these are not only just lectures, but it's a challenge for us to see whether or not are we walking towards that particular path. And I suppose it's a challenge. And someone who has this particular challenge, and you often hear how heavy it weighs on his shoulders when you engage with him. And that is Mr. Monde, Monde Nlovo, Ukajen. As you come to give a word from the family, I suppose these are also just reflections you possibly would have had over time. And I said to you this week, and deliberately so, that your father would be very proud of you. Very, very proud of you. And I hope we, you know, we can give him a round of applause because... <laughs> in a time where legacies, as Mr. Mtunzi has said, are defined in one way or another, his legacy, as I've heard over time, has remained consistent. So as you come up to give a word from the family, I know that you have a burden on you, but he definitely would be very proud and well done. These short people. A very good evening, colleagues. Oh, colleagues. A very good evening to you, colleagues. Yeah. I enjoy, I enjoy feedback um, quite a bit. So please indulge me. My dear sister in transformation, uh, our MC, Bongiwe Zwane, Mam Shelly, Machaba, and PwC partners, we thank you for the opportunity once again, and you've walked this journey for us. I think this is now the seventh lecture that you have sponsored. We know that uh, uh, it means something to you, and it means a lot to us that you've walked this journey with the BMF and the trust and the family, and we do not take your contribution lightly. So we thank you for the seventh lecture that you have sponsored. We know that uh, you might sponsor another seven. Uh, as I had said many years ago here, uh, that out of all the decisions our father made, the best decision he made was being with you and choosing you as our mother and his companion. <laughs> so without you, there would not have been a lot in Lovu, um, to this extent. And we thank you for allowing him to be what he decided to be in his complexity, uh, in his many shades of complexity. Um, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate you and uh, for what you've done for us. By the way, um, when we celebrated our parents deliberately, it's a few years before uh, he passed away and also my elder sister passed away, one of the things that he said about you was that I take no um, responsibility for how these kids are today. They are who they are today because of who you have been and the role that you have played. So he said, I take no responsibility at all. So I would never forget that him honoring you that way, that uh, he takes no responsibility in who we have become. Anshayn is I want to <laughs> Prof. Kutlu, thank you very much, Baba, for your leadership. Um, greatly appreciated. One of the things that has fascinated me a lot with the stalwarts, um, after being part of the BMF, 
after uh, Ubaba passed away, BMF immediately embraced the family. Uh, and Mr. Mtunzi, as I would always keep saying, he dragged me to the BMF, even though I didn't want to be in the BMF. So he dragged me to the BMF continually to do that. And one of the things that I greatly admired um, is how the stalwarts as well, uh, having the privilege to work with my father's contemporaries, so it's Prof. Kushu, um, at some point Dr. Koza, uh, at the present moment it's Babu Eric Mafuna, uh, which is a great privilege. I, I never envisaged that something like that would ever happen. And so we, we, we owe it to Mr. Mtuzi for, for dragging me into the BMF when I refused to be dragged into the BMF. And so for me, really humbled to be working with yourself um, and Mr. Mtunzi with Mr. Mohale at some stage and being exposed to the wealth of wisdom. Um, and now I understand how the contemporaries think in terms of metaphors. Mr. Mtunzi spoke about metaphors and analogies and storytelling. I sit with Mr. Mafuna and it's just storytelling after storytelling after storytelling. Uh, and so I'm also becoming a story storyteller as well because of those engagements. So I'm greatly humbled at that opportunity. And Chinese art. We must also thank uh, the BMF, you know, the Star Wars online. Also thank Dr. Vilagazi um, and the great task that you have ahead of yourself. Uh, the BMF, uh, as articulated by Mr. Mtunz, which I won't, which I won't repeat um, what he said, but the BMF means a lot to our family uh, because of the great sacrifice our father made. Not only that, but through his example in leadership, um, in being self-sacrificial, when we, we want the BMF to do well. We want the BMF to succeed because we know what it meant to him and we understand what it means to us. So if the BMF fails, we then also feel we have failed as a family. And so that is the burden um, that we carry, that it, we are intertwined at the hip with BMF. Uh, almost immediately after Baba passed away, they were there, and they're still there till today. And so we've embraced each other, and we really want to see the BMF uh, continue to excel and embrace the principles of Lot and Lovo. So Dr. Vilagazi and your leadership and the team and the MD as well, we're really grateful for the work that you have done and the support you have given the legacy, the support you've given, the trust over the years, and this is to another 10 years and more. Siabong. <laughs> Mr. Mtunzi, uh, my brother, uh, I know we like to debate, uh, don't agree all the time, but you know where it comes from. I don't have to explain it. Um, last year you said you had a lot to say about Lot, and today, uh, Prof. Kushu said you need to speak a lot about Lot, <laughs> and now you've done so. Thank you very much, my brother. Thank you for that uh, reflection. We really appreciate it. The milestone of the 10 is really something quite magnanimous. Uh, it's not taken uh, lightly as well. And another thing which I think is also needs to be highlighted is that I think in your generation, you're the first to do the lecture. Uh, as well, right across. So, so it is significant for, for that as well that uh, he, Mr. Mtuzi's generation has also begun to, to, to interpret Lawton and Lovu and, and give us different shades of who he has been and who he has been to you. And I know he meant a lot uh, to you as well, and uh, you mean a lot to us as well as a family. We greatly appreciate your brotherhood and your friendship. Siabong. So with all of these uh, uh, milestones, um, 10 years, 20 years of the Triple B Act, 30 years of the Affirmative Action Blueprint, the critical mass issue, um, et cetera, et cetera. But there is this question of a generational interpretation of legacy as to, as to why. And it's critical that we appreciate and acknowledge that there may come a generation that may further question us as to why we must keep on uh, celebrating Lot and Lovu. And the lecture has now stood as an institution of knowledge sharing. And with this generational interpretation, 
I think one of the things we may need to think about and look at is, I mean, the video snippet was done by the marketing team, by the way, at BMF. Uh, they cut that very well, and I think they did a, a splendid job. With all of the lectures, even the written, the written, we've got the written copies as well, for us to develop um, um, another book with that. And uh, we have started to talk about that at some point with, with Mr. Mtunzi, that we need to start thinking about those things. We also know that um, the biography as well is not done. In fact, it's not even started as yet because UJ had said they wanted to do a proper bio of Lawton Lovu. They just wanted the right writer. So every writer we went to them with, um, they said, no, not this one. Uh, no, not that one. Not this one. So it's been a couple of years back and forth. Ho hopefully, we'll find the right person who would have a proper generational lens and interpretation of who he is and get the rich story of Lawton Rovu's bio for future generations. Because the question will be asked, just like when we change names and remove statues, people ask the question because when we do those things, it invokes different emotions in different people. It's not the same consistent emotion in every person, but it invokes something different to different people. So you may find out that there are people who not really appreciate Lot and Love, and it's okay. Then there are those that who do, but we need to be able to back it up correctly so that without equivocation, without question, that when a pharaoh rises in 20, 30 years' time, in terms of new leadership in the BMF or in the black leadership space, and they ask the question, what did he do? Like Mandela has been questioned almost on a daily basis, but he sold us out, he did this and that. Those questions will come, but there must be an answer. And I believe that this lecture as an institution, a memoriam of who he was, stands as an answer to the repetitive questioning that we get both formally and informally. The other issue, very quickly, I, I won't take a lot of your ears. Um, they tell us that children go through three, three phases, especially boys, when they look at their fathers. So when they're small little boys, they idolize him. When they get to a certain age, they begin to demonize him. And when they get to the third phase, they begin to humanize him. And many, or, many of us go through those kind of uh, um, stages where you idolize your father, idolize your parents to a certain point until you start realizing other things or you don't want to hear their advice and you start demonizing their advice and not taking it seriously. But when you get to the humanizing stage where you also start making mistakes and you also realize that in actual fact, um, your father or your mother was right about X, Y, and Z, you begin to rehumanize yourself. In other words, you go back to being a child in appreciating the people around you. So, understanding Lord Lovu not only as a human being, as a leader, but to elevate him as an idea. So when you elevate him as an idea, you are able to separate the good the bad that you don't like, what you don't appreciate, and appreciate him as an idea, as a concept to be championed. And I think with the lecture, we're really getting to that stage where he is becoming an idea, what we represent, what we ought to aspire to, not only as a human being, but as an idea. Therefore, the BMF as well is not an individual. The BMF is an idea, and that is why it has lasted this long, because it's not about a human being, but it is about the ideas, the ideals that must stand the test of time. So, so all of uh, my siblings, I must tell you, by the all of us are activists in one way or another, right? Um, if you, if you, uh, it's a pity my late sister uh, um, is not around anymore, but we used to put all of us together. I think the, the person that would keep quiet the most is myself, followed by my father, um, then maybe my mother, but all of us are activists, very loud. Um, um, it's a pity Tem is not here, her children are not well, uh, that's why she's not here. But all of us are loud, activists in one way or another, 
champions of, of, of justice in, their own, in our own ways because of the kind of parents that, that we have. We, we would be scolded um, if we were not to take uh, uh, issues of, of, of justice seriously at home. Um, if we were helping people out and we dragged our feet, our parents would give us a hiding because of how they grew up and when they start seeing some complacency setting in, they'd get very, very, very angry. So that happened to me with my father directly when I didn't want to do something uh, in terms of assisting someone else when I was still a teenager um, in the extended family, I got scolded. So, so it's very, very important also to know that um, my sisters are also activists. They are far better uh, speakers than myself, far better thinkers than myself, for I'm the last born, like I keep saying, I was the one who was not planned. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. But I think lastly, um, from a BMF point of view, I just want to briefly remind the BMF of its own seven principles. It's one of the things that we don't talk much about in the BMF, so I'm also a member now of the BMF. Um, I had worked for the BMF as well, um, which, is, which was a great honor for me, um, which was great. And so in our discourses, in what we engage in the BMF, here and there, some of these principles, we don't talk about them enough. So, so I think part of his message, if, we were to, if you were here, I think he would want to remind us about the many things, but more specifically about the principles that drive the BMF, the framework, the thinking, the the, frame, the lens that must be used to understand the time, the context, the future must be driven by principles and everything else would hang on, on those principles. So very briefly, I'm not going to unpack them. Um, um, Babum Tunzi has done that. Principle number one, the optimum use of the country's human resources. Principle number two, equal opportunity, self-development and advancement. Principle number three, establishment of conditions and structures for strong economic growth. Number four, a just non-racial democracy for South Africa as one nation. Number five, an Africa-centered management and leadership perspective which takes South Africa as a point of departure in relating to the global political economy. So not the other way around can't be too globally minded, but you're absent in this village. Number six, liaison with other organizations predicated on freedom of association, but most importantly, and principled alliances. Not unprincipled alliances, but principled alliances. And the last principle, promotion of justice, non-violence, peace, and stability. As I sit down, a story is told of a young girl whom a philanthropist on the, on the African continent was assisting um, with wheelchairs, um, et cetera. And she requested for him to come closer, come closer, come closer. And then she says, I want to look at your face. I want to remember your face so that when I I'm in heaven one day. I can look for you and thank you again. And I'm sure that when we think about Lord and Lord, we think about the legacy, we think about BMF, we want to see its face so that one day we may thank him when we see him again, when we thank the BMF for his contribution, for what they have done. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your support. We appreciate it. Almost there, hey, hey, Monday. Okay, almost there, almost, almost, almost. Hey, Lebohang Pasha, where is Lebohang Pasha? That's the only person who's gonna eat tonight. I, that's the only tweet I have just seen. 
So angi kosho ukuthi kwenza kalani. Kwenza kalani. Twitter. I want to know hurry. What are some of the nuggets? Because I'm I'm using the hashtags. I don't see the hashtags. Hey, as a LinkedIn except so man. Professional Epsug. Professional Epsug. Fine. Just for you, I'll go to LinkedIn. I'll go to LinkedIn. So hashtag leadership inspiration. Hashtag lot global lecture. Hashtag 10th lot global lecture. Hashtag PWC. Hashtag reimagining SA together. So far, the Bukhang Pasha. Kwenanje. Who will eat? And um, before we move on, we're almost literally right at the end of our program. But before we do that, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, in the spirit of Ogbonga, I would like Umam Glovu, as well as Umam Gulu, to stand up. Um, and we honor them this evening, Siabonga. Please, let's give them a round of applause. Because sometimes we forget that wind beneath somebody's wings. We appreciate the product, but we do not appreciate the driver, you know, the actual person who makes the stage possible for the person who we celebrate. So we're celebrating with Professor Nkutlu, we're excited, but we need to look back because when the stage is set, there is someone who takes a huge personal sacrifice to allow the individual who's being celebrated to be celebrated. So, we are learning. 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 And um, as I call the next speaker, who's the final speaker for us tonight, um, Dr. Sibongile Vilagaz. Dr. Villagazi, before I even read your bio, there's something I just want to, to touch on that you said. And it's, 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 it's quite, it struck me because you were writing about something that has just happened. And you say, one of the national agendas for South Africa that is supposed to be a non-negotiable is the transformation of socioeconomic dynamics and opportunity distribution to reflect the population of the country. I won't read the whole article. And then you continue to say, in actual fact, women leaders are not wanted. Why would despondency not set in after this? And I won't say um, in the context, well, you, you can say in the context at which you were writing, because when I was reading it, it was, for me, something that is a conversation that you were starting again, again, to say, why has it become negotiable? Why is it an option and not something that we do? And not only South Africa in the context of the country, but it challenged me as a person, just as an individual, on a daily basis to say, what becomes the role? So Dr. Vilagazi. Um, the president of the Black Management Forum. She's also a research psychologist with a PhD in organizational development and diversity uh, management. And uh, she completed her PhD at Vets Business School. She's also the founder of Nzigelelo Business Solutions, a consulting business. She consults for small, medium, and corporate organizations on business transformation strategy. So transformation is something that is very close to her heart and she's the chairman of the Gauteng Growth and Development Agency and an independent non-executive director of the South African Music Rights Association, Samro Board. And those are the people I often fight with um, when I do my stories. Hey, you must watch where you have friends before you come up, Dr. Villagas. Watch the friends you keep, please. I just received a WhatsApp from a friend of mine who's telling me he wants his own dinner and he's fighting with me. Rems Mabote. I will check your tweet. I will see if you tweet it and if it does exist. If it exists, you will have dinner. For now, hold on. It's Dr. Villagas's time. So Dr. Villagas, over to you.
Thank you so much, our pro program director. I think you've done a really stunning job this evening. We appreciate you. <laughs> is it better? Okay, I think it is. I think it is better. Um, I'm, I'm quite aware that I'm now standing in between dinner, <laughs> and it's quite late. So I'm going to go straight to the point and greet the Kajeni family. Thank you so much once again for allowing us to celebrate this great man that we love so dearly as an organization, who inspires us so much as an organization, and the foundation that keeps allowing us to have this year in and year out. And we are really hoping that it will continue for a long time. We appreciate you as a family, and we thank you for allowing us to have this man. To our past presidents that are in the room, Prof, and uh, Mr. Mingane, thank you so much um, for inspiring us, for continuing net graduating, as Mr. Mingane has said, um, out of the BMF. We need you. We need you to remind us of what it means to lead this organization. Um, because as times change, new dynamics enter and we need your firm hand to keep on showing us the way. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, and for this um, uh, um, lecture, um, President, wow. <laughs> it was informative and, ed and educational at the same time. We know more um, and better about Uga Jenin, but also about some of the dynamics of the country and the challenge that you have given to the BMF, I accept it. <laughs> so I will be calling you. <laughs> I'll be calling you to then come and partner as we uh, explore how best do we move forward on these um, ideas. To our guest, um, our members of the organization, potential members who are going to be joining after this session. <laughs> I greet you, and I see there's my, my queen president. Uh, I call her, and she calls me. Thank you so much for being here and for always supporting the cause. I greet everybody um, who's, who's here in this room. Um, from the BMF, the life of Gajen could not be most apt inspiration in this time that we find ourselves in, as an organization and as a country. You all know that we've just come out of a very painful, uh, not so distant um, uh, past as an organization, we've had to make decisions that um, have really hurt us, I think, as, a, as an organization. We didn't want to make those kind of decisions. They were painful. Um, but what kept us going was the structures that Obabuka Jane and the team at the time put in place to govern the organization. They were able to hold this organization intact and provide direction while the organization was navigating its way back home. We thank the wisdom and foresight of Obabu Kajeni that we are all here and the organization is standing intact. The organization has, has managed to come out standing tall and possibly better than we could have imagined. Just like he and his peers worked hard to reposition the organization to be relevant and have meaning in their time, when it was becoming clear that we were about to attain political power as black people. As the current leadership, we also find ourselves having to work just as hard, if not harder, to position the organization as not only relevant, but trustworthy, to continue to carry the voice of black managers and black majority who remain economically excluded. The identity and posture that the BMF needed to take then in the context of political changes. We are once again grateful to the wisdom Yobab Gajeni and his leadership that assisted the organization to choose correctly because that choice continues to shield us as a nonpartisan organization. We are able to speak truth to power while partnering effectively with the very same power to advance the transformation agenda. I am happy to rep report to you our ancestor, who is surely with us today, that the organization found courage to confront one of its most limitations, 
of pushing women leaders to the echelons of the organization. We are here currently navigating what this means for the organization and the legacy thereof. But we have done it. The organization has been able to do it. 47 years later, it is led by women. I am sad, though, to report that you were correct in yours and Brad Dawn's assertion that political freedom without economic freedom will be meaningless. That total liberation included the marrying of political power and, and economic power. That since the vision of BEE has not landed as it was intended, we remain poor and far from total liberation as a black people. That you were correct that the single most important ingredient to getting BEE implemented correctly was individual level ethical leadership. We currently find um, that the enemy is now this very same individual level ethical leadership. People no longer know the difference between leadership to serve people and leadership positions to advance one's economic emancipation. It has become normal for people to aspire for leadership positions in order to take care of themselves and their families. As a result, all the gains we, have made, we had made as a country have almost all gone to waste as people hurry to use public resources to take care of self, no one is caring for the public. Again, this is because you were correct that the failure of BEE would be the failure of democracy. Here we are at the brink of a failed democracy because we have failed to successfully implement BEE. I am happy though to report that we are here. We see what's happening and we have the energy to do something about it. Your words, Gajeni, continue to inspire us to stand tall and to just push when you said there is a price for doing the right thing, that it takes courage to be an ethical leader. We continue to draw courage from your courageous leadership. We are here holding the baton. With our hands shaking, but firmly we are holding it. We will not drop it. We shall carry it until the end, because failure is not an option. Ethics and principles are a non-negotiable, because our collective success as a people depend on it. We are calling for your spirit. We are invoking you to come to be upon us, to guide us, to see us through to victory. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much for continuing to support the BMF. Um, please enjoy your meal as you are about to have your meal. Thank you so much, Koli. You've been a soldier of this organization. Thank you for putting all of this in partnership with the foundation. Good evening. Good Okay, okay, okay. I see the tweets are coming. Hey, yeah, no. The, 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 the hunger is speaking. Always threaten people with food. You'll get cooperation, trust me. It's an MC's dream. The minute you start threatening about food, ah, cooperation is there right there at the top. And I'm, see every, I'm seeing even one of my favorite people tweeted as well, Felicia. Um, she tweeted as well. See, I'm seeing the tweets. Felicia Butel is a tweet, uh, in fact, on LinkedIn, uh, talking about how worthy he is to be celebrated. I'm yet to find more LinkedIn posts, but, 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 it's okay. I'm watching. So, towards the end, so there's evidence. I shall approach your chambers during this time. So one of the things that um, is always important is this particular part of the program to also just honor and thank people. So I'll ask you, Dr. Vilagazi, to come back. Uh, Professor Nkuhlu, uh, please come back. Mamun Lovu, Gitalan Sondele. There is Umkrimbi. And we all know how important Lumkrimbi is. Gizoshia Zandlenze, Oguten Sondele, Ngoba, Lumkrimbo Balulegega Kul, Menangao Henda Over, 
Oguti umtimbi. Angaz guti nsogunze. Please may I have a roving mic. Ngezo kutelu guti umtimbi. New kube. Ngale ntele nzo kuba ngayo. Ngeza tole evidence. Yam lape mova. Si. Si bono guti. Wahamba ganja umtimbi. So we may give them the mics. Thank you. Uh, it's really a great uh, privilege for us, for me as uh, chairman of Lord Nlovu Trust, together with the president of BMF, to say, Sizanele, we present to Mnane our guest lecturer today, Nlovu. Don't you just love me at this moment? Don't you just love me at this moment? So, this is the part where I get to hear from you how much you love me so you can go eat. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not closing the program. <laughs> but honestly, thank you so much, um, ladies and gentlemen, for being part of this evening. And I know, Wuti, it meant a lot to Oka Jenny um, and the BMF, and also for the pleasure of your company as well, because as program director, you sometimes don't even know what kind of crowd you're going to find. And it awkward very quickly, you know. But thank you so much for, for the warm welcome and the beautiful cooperation. And sir, I'm so sorry that you sat alone at the table. I really do apologize. Ah, uh, you see, you see, you see. I... Then we are done. But thank you so much. And please note that dinner, let's do the left and right thing again. Right. So, dinner, left. Uh, you go all the way, you pass the stairs, you will see dinner that side. And ladies and gents restrooms, right, right, and you'll be able to see the signs. But from me, it's been a great honor to be your program director this evening. I thank you very much.